The warden is like out of central casting. Cowboy boots. Feet up on the desk, reading Playboy magazine. He says, he planning to pay these guys anything? I said, no, no, I, I, I'm not paying them. I pay them anything. He says, that's right. Pay them what they're worth. Nothing. So I do these interviews. Fabulous interviews. One of them is with this guy, Randall Dale Adams. And he tells me this story, and I have no understanding of what he's talking about. He was talking about the kid, the kid, he said this, he said that. He was a good squirrely character. Did I think he was innocent? No, not really. No, I assumed he was guilty. And that was the beginning of three years of investigation. I'm Jack Goldsmith, and this is the Lawfare Podcast of November 22nd, 2023. The great documentary filmmaker Errol Morris is best known for films such as The Thin Blue Line and The Fog of War. His latest film, The Pigeon Tunnel, is about the great espionage novelist Jean Le Carré, whose real name is David Cornwell. I recently sat down with Morris to talk about The Pigeon Tunnel. We discussed Le Carré's complex and contradictory attitudes towards the Cold War, the influence of the traitorous British intelligence officer Kim Philby on Le Carré's work, what Morris and Lacare have in common as documentarians, and how Lacare compares with Graham Greene and Joseph Conrad. Morris also reflected on his craft, including the difference between an interview and an interrogation, and how he learned to interview a subject without saying anything. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 22nd, The Pigeon Tunnel. Errol Morris interviews John Lacare. What's your favorite Lacare novel? Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Why? Because I was able to finish it, I could start it at the very beginning and make my way through to the very end. And you couldn't with the others? Not really. I've only been able to read two from beginning to end, that one and Tinker Taylor. And I started the other ones, but they're extremely complicated. Needlessly complicated. And yet you think he's a great novelist. I'm not sure. I've been thinking about it. What have you been thinking? I've been thinking how much I like The Pigeon Tunnel, the memoir. It's my favorite. Yep. How much I like John Cornwell, John le Carré, David Cornwell, John le Carré. How much I like his nonfiction. His nonfiction is great. It really is. It's really, really, really great. So The Pigeon Tunnel is his, I guess it's his memoir. And it's this kind of strange, brilliantly written, disjointed thing. Yes. Why, why did you like it? Uh, for the reasons that you just stated. Disjointed, brilliantly written. At one time I used the word picaresque. I think that's absolutely wrong. It's a kind of odd mosaic of various different parables, brief scenes, all th thrown together. There's a higgledy-piggledy element. But they hang together. And I listened to it. I didn't read it. And, and in his voice, it's especially compelling. No, his voice is overwhelmingly compelling. One thing that I have really liked about the Pigeon Tunnel, so I make these comparisons between John le Carré and other writers. In this case, it's Kafka of all people, because Kafka wrote these extraordinary parables before the law, which I am sure you are familiar with. Somewhat. What does that mean? What does that parable mean? I'm not sure. I know that it's really powerful, suggestive of all kinds of things, despairing, but what does it exactly mean? I'm not sure. So Jean Le Carré has two stories, the very beginning of the Pigeon Tunnel and the very end of the Pigeon Tunnel. The first story is the Pigeon Tunnel. Explain what that is. Happy to do so. And it's not even part of it. It's like uh, the frontispiece on a separate page. Brief, 
I think it's a much more extended version in the movie that I made uh, about it. As a young man, he was brought to Monte Carlo by his father. Uh, on the roof of the casino, they would raise pigeons. And there were tunnels. Tunnels leading from the area of the coops out over the Mediterranean. Dark tunnels. They would send these pigeons through the tunnels emerge in the brilliance sunlight and shooters on the roof of the casino, I imagine them as disgruntled gamblers, would take pot shots at them, killing some, wounding others. Some got away. And the ones that got away, what would they do? They would just return to their roosts on the roof of the casino and then on some following day, they'd be sent out, and it would be repeated all over again. Sisyphean, if you like, and a metaphor for human existence, perhaps because it's repetition that ends with death. So he, he entitled his memoir, The Pigeon Tunnel, that's the name of your film. He said, I think he said that at one point or another, every book he wrote started off with this title. This experience of his, you didn't convey that his father who brought him there was a charlatan of sorts. Why was this experience so central to him in his life? And why did it grab you so much? Uh, I imagine he was attracted, as I was attracted, to the existential bleakness of it all. One of my very favorite stories, I don't even know if it's apocryphal or not, like most of the stories that I know, is a story about Franz Kafka and his close friend Max Brod. At some point, Max Brod looked at his friend Franz and said, what about hope? Surely you believe in hope, don't you? And Franz looked at Max and said, yes, of course, just not for us. You think that's what Lacare thought? I do. He was a German romantic. Well, he's British, but obsessed with German literature, obsessed with Faust. What I also thought about that particular parable is its connection to spycraft at least as I imagined it, that in the story, they're the shooters and the pigeons. And presumably there are also those people sending the pigeons through the tunnels out over the water. So somehow, somewhere, don't ask me to do an exact parallel between the story and the parable, what it means. They're string pullers and they're dupes. I say this to him at the very beginning of the movie. It's a universe. Yeah, you have to be one or the other. You're either manipulating something or you're being manipulated by something. That's the Le Carre cosmology. And then, by the very end, of the book, he tells a story about Rudolf Hess. Now, this is a story that I'm familiar with, kind of a little bit obsessed with. Why did one of the highest ranking officials of the Third Reich commandeer a plane, 1941, this is right at the end of the Blitz, commandeer a plane and fly to Scotland. Say ostensibly he was trying to engineer a peace between the Third Reich and the British government. But no one really knows. So Le Carre tells a story about the 
holy of holies, the safe, and MI6. He's such an odd duck, this guy. I mean, I find him really, really fascinating. It, it, it's, it's apparent that you do. And I really, I like him a lot. So, what's the parable? The parable is they finally open this safe. This is a safe in MI6 where the deep secrets are kept. The deepest secrets. The deepest the secrets. secret of all. Right. The inmost room. Right. It's what, you know, Faust in the early parts of Goethe's Faust is searching for. And they get the safe open, and it's empty. But that's not enough for Mr. Le Carre. Uh, they pry the safe away from the wall, and they find behind it a pair of trousers. <laughs> and they take the trousers out, and then pinned to the seat of the trousers is a note saying, please analyze. These are Rudolf Hess's trousers. Please analyze may give us a clue to the nature of the German textile industry. So what is this? It's at the root of history. Perhaps for us, it's just something unknowable and utterly absurd. No one writes about this in any of the reviews. You mean the ending that you just described? Any, what interests me about why I made the movie, they don't write about it they don't engage with it it's it's like i made this movie for somebody i made it for myself clearly but what what is it they're not engaging with that they should be engaging with oh i get endless criticisms that i didn't deal with his sex life because all of these recent tell-all books have come out and i didn't engage with it you know i didn't ask him about all his extramarital affairs and he said he wouldn't talk about that anyway. He also said he wouldn't talk about it. And I have to say, my interest in it, not great. You know, I'm sorry. But what is it that the, the, the reviewers missed about the film with regard to what you were just saying about the meaning of history? That it's basically a work of philosophy. Do I sound really pretentious? I'm no, sorry. you don't. <laughs> but I'm thinking about all of these, these themes that are part of his work. So as I was doing more and more interviews, I got in the habit of comparing him to Graham Greene and to Joseph Conrad. Why? Because these are two writers that traveled widely and turned their travels in some form or another into literature. David most certainly did. I was curious about the nature of the meat grinder. I don't know how better to put it. The meat grinder, you know, you go to Southeast Asia, you go to Germany, you go to Africa, and you produce these novels. And part of the novels is a very strong historical component. The whole beginning of it is the story of him going to Germany. He's living in Bonn. And he's working for MI6, and he's also a civil servant, foreign service officer. No, I found this stuff really, really, really interesting. Originally, this was going to be a five-part series, and I had written scripts, blah, 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 blah. The hour-and-a-half film was going to be a five-part series. Yes. What, what got happened? left out? What happened is that they said they didn't want a five-part series. They wanted a movie. I see. So these philosophical issues, a lot of the reviewers said, you read the reviews. Yes? Some of them? Compulsively. Okay. Oh, that's great. So they were very favorable on the whole. And a lot of the reviewers said that you and Le Carre were a perfect match. Because Whatever you're, that means. Well, I'm going to say what they said. They said that you were both in your art and your work preoccupied with the nature of truth and the relationship of truth to fiction and history and self-deception and the like. 
also that Le Carre himself was a military interrogator. There's a lot of back and forth in the film about the nature of interrogation. He's interrogating you at places. What do you think about that? Is, is there something about, are, are y'all like-minded in some sense? I think we're both really, really odd documentarians. Him and me both. His need to go out in the field, if you believe Adam Sisman's new book, his need to have affairs with people out in the field when he was researching his novels. I find it all, all interesting. And yes, a kind of kindred spirit. At first I wondered, why do people think that this is an adversarial interview? And then I just realized, he starts it that way. Who are you? I can't even imagine something more adversarial. So this is just, just to be clear, this is how you start the film. And you start the film with what I think is the beginning of the first interview with him. Yes. And he asks... And starts interviewing you, basically. Yes. And asks who you are and says he needs to know who you are. Yes. And what did you think of that? It scared me. Uh, I answer, I believe truthfully, that I don't think I can answer the question. Not because I don't want to answer the question, because I don't think I can. Who am I? I'm not really altogether sure who I am. But he said he had studied you carefully. And Which he, he did. And he says that... He concluded that you are, and these are his words, sometimes a spectral figure. I don't mind being a spectral figure. Sometimes you're God. I don't think I'm God. And but sometimes, and sometimes you say so. And sometimes you're present. Yes. So what did you think about that? I think it's probably true. But then he says something very, very provocative. He suggests that there might not be a difference between interrogations and interviews. Can you before you but can you explain what the traditional distinction is for so people understand? I think I can. Because I started to wonder, well, maybe he's right, maybe there is no difference. But there is a difference. Clearly there's a difference. And the best way to describe the difference is to tell you how I look at interviews and what I think an interrogation is. Because after all, I did work as a private detective. Oh, you like this story. Some guy asked me once, do you Mirandize your interview subjects? <laughs> I said, what? Do I Mirandize my interview subjects? Well, first of all, I am not a cop. I am not an agent to the government. I am a filmmaker. Of course I don't Mirandize my interview subjects. Why? You have a right to remain silent. You have a right to have an attorney present. You know, you should be advised that anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. No, I don't do that. In interrogation, you are interested in eliciting some specific piece of information, usually. You want someone to fess up, to spill the beans, um, to tell you something that invariably they don't want to tell you, and it's not even in their best interest to tell you, but somehow you're going to drag it out of them anyway. Whether it's careful questioning or or thumb screws, whatever. You're going to get it. You're going to get it out of them. When I first started interviewing people, I would play a game. And the game was, can you do an interview without saying anything? I call it the shut the fuck up school of interviewing. So... I would have these Sony tape recorders, cassettes, maybe a half hour on a side or an hour on a side, and I would go into a room. This is when I was interviewing in Plainfield, Wisconsin, uh, in connection with the story of this killer, Ed Gein. I'd have the tape recorder running. It would be already turned on. So you didn't do this. Um, the tape recorder would be turned on, and I would 
hold it in plain sight. I'd walk in. Hello. I'm Errol Morris. Tra la 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 la. And I'd put the tape recorder down on the table, running, uh, without making any reference to it. But it was there, clearly present. And I'd see if I could get an interview without my voice on it. And did you succeed? I did. It's a crazy task, but I think I got good at it. And I'm not even sure to what end. It becomes the stream of consciousness narration that made Gates of Heaven my first film possible. Your questioning seems to me to still have that element. Well, good. But... What did Lacare say to you that made you question the distinction between... Why did he make you question the distinction between interrogation and interviews? You, you, you see yourself as doing interviews, not interrogations. Uh, I'm always willing to see myself as an idiot, because I might possibly be one. But also an interviewer. <laughs> and also an interviewer. And not an interrogator, yes? When I was... Working on the Thin Blue Line, okay, this is a classic kind of investigation. A guy has been convicted of the murder of a Dallas police officer. He has been sentenced to die in the electric chair. He comes within three days of being electrocuted. I'm investigating whether this was a miscarriage of justice, whether he didn't kill the cop. And if he didn't kill the cop, who did? So I am interested, you might argue, I'm interested in interrogations. I'm interested in eliciting empirical facts, details. And what I find interesting, it still interests me, and I should write about it. My favorite interview was with this supposed eyewitness, Emily Miller, who's driving by with her husband, R.L. Miller, and they see this shooting. So she's in a lineup room. I could not find the lineup sheets in her case. In some cases, I could find them. I could not find them in her case. And... I just put her in front of my camera and she started talking. She says, everywhere I go, there's murders, even around my house. And she goes on and on and on and on. Do I think that that everywhere she goes, there's murders? No, I don't. Do I think she's batshit crazy? I do. She says she wanted to be a detective or the wife of a detective. And she's always trying to solve crimes of one kind or another. Well, this is not standard interrogation technique. It's stream of consciousness, something or other. And at some point, she starts to explain to me why she failed to pick out the defendant. In a police lineup. So I, st- I'd like to s- make it sound as though I'm smart, but I wasn't smart. I just simply asked her, well, how do you know you failed to pick out the defendant? And she says, well, I know because the policeman sitting next to me told me I had picked the wrong person and then pointed out the right person so I wouldn't make that mistake ever again. I don't know. (laughs) Do I love that interview? Kind of do. And I'm not sure that the hammer and tongs approach would have been in any way effective. So is is this by way of saying that there's not a distinction between... I mean, I had always understood you to be... In your films, it seems you don't have a concrete plan in many of the films for what you're trying to elicit. I don't. 
But in that situation, you were obviously trying to prove something. That may have been a counterexample. Yeah, I knew, I knew there had to be something there. What did Lacare say to you that made you rethink this, if anything? He said there was no difference. It just made me wonder, is it all context-dependent? Is it all a mixture of both? Is something of A and B going on all the time? I'd gone out of my way to try to bracket myself off from that kind of thing. But clearly, take the thin blue line. Was I interested in whether Reynold Dale Adams was guilty of capital murder or not? Of course I was interested. It's the whole purpose of being down there and talking to people. So it would be disingenuous. It would be, you know, a rat-faced lie to say that I wasn't interested. You wanted to have this philosophical discussion about yeah. truth and his views of that and deception and, and betrayal. You wanted to have that discussion. You were trying to elicit those things. So there were a few things that surprised me. One was, well, this didn't surprise me, but to start with, he was really, really disenchanted and angry about the Cold War. And that came through. Am I right about that? Absolutely. What was he angry about? Well, and this, I think, led to him writing his novels. One of the things that really disappointed me that we didn't do something that was more extended, like the series, whatever, it's the second chapter. In the Pigeon Tunnel. Chapter 2. He's in Bonn. He's the civil servant, also working for MI6. And he tells us that there are Nazis everywhere. The Bundesrepublik is filled with Nazis. Uh, I suppose as, a, as an American Jew, do I believe in ex-Nazis? Not so much. You know, once a Nazi, always a Nazi. Hans Globke, who originated the Nuremberg Laws, which many people credit as that starting point for the Holocaust, he's a major figure in the new German government. What does that tell us? Point is, what was the point of the war? He says as much. Didn't we fight a war? And he also talked about invented enemies, which surprised me. It's fantastic. But he didn't act as if he really believed they were invented enemies. I mean, he, when he was in college, I can't remember if he was working for MI5 or MI6, but he was ratting on his communist buddies. Yep. He went to Russia. He, he felt at the same time that he was angry about the Cold War, this seemed like a contradiction to me. It is a contradiction. He was angry about the... Go ahead. But guess what? What? People are filled with contradictions. Right. People are inconsistent. People are confused. People often act at cross-purposes with themselves. What I found interesting, I wondered at times, is this guy a lot less cynical than I am? And you cite, you cite you know, his role infiltrating a student organization at Oxford, Stanley Mitchell. He betrays them. And I ask him, well, didn't he feel, you know, kind of bad about doing that? And he says, they're on the wrong side of history. They yeah. had sworn allegiance to Stalin. Stalin, bad guy. Stalin, evil. But in the next sentence, when you asked him a question, he said, he's not so sure he was on the right side. Yep. And I didn't understand how he was really angry about Kim Philby and his defection and his everything about Philby. Yeah. It seems like that was a huge event, organizing event in his life. And because he thought, I think he said Philby was evil for facilitating Stalinism, basically. And betraying yeah. Her Majesty's government. Which seems in deep tension to me with his attitude towards the Cold War. Yes? Yes, I agree. Completely. He tells a story, going to a writer's conference in Moscow, invited to have dinner with Philby. Philby is now 
already defected to the Soviet Union. Just so people understand, Philby was very high up in British counterintelligence, and it, and, had, and for decades, had he was been, considered to at one time to run MI6. Right. And for decades, he had been a Soviet spy. Yeah. Many decades. Yes. His whole career. Yeah. Soviet spy. An essential figure in many, many different ways in John le Carre's novels. He's not named Philby in the novels. He's given various names, but he's there in one form or another. Hayden and Tinker, Taylor, soldier, spy. So, invited to this dinner, he says, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to this dinner. I'm not having dinner. This is his words. I'm not having dinner with the Queen's representative on one evening and dinner with the Queen's trader on another. So there's this reminder again and again that there is such a thing as good and evil, right and wrong. And at the same time, this kind of a strange existential soup where it's all chaos, it's all meaningless, it's all random. And I think that's one of the interesting things about his writing. Yeah, and it came through in the interview, that those, that tension and those contradictions. That's thought, good. That's the nicest thing anyone has ever said I'm about sorry, my movie. It, it came very through very clearly. One more question on Philby. He talked about the allure of betrayal betrayal and risk taking yeah and that that was really what drove philby and it sounds like we haven't talked yet about his father lakari's father who has a large role in the film and in the memoir who also seemed to get a thrill from betrayal and risk taking i mean is that why philby philby has this outsized influence in the film and i thought and in his life is there a connection to the father, or is that accidental? No, it can't be accidental. There has to be a, a real connection. His father was involved in all kinds of family betrayals and betrayals of investors and so on and so forth. Philby was a betrayer on some much bigger historical stage. But I'm not sure I understand much of it. I mean, I understand investigating because it's sort of what I do. When I was an out-of-work filmmaker, I made two movies. They were kind of weird. They were kind of good, but they were kind of weird. Which ones? Gates of Heaven. Weird but good. And Vernon, Florida. Weird but good. Weird but good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> and I wasn't necessarily... I wasn't employable. No one wanted to give me money to make anything more. You know, I had to earn a living. And so I worked as a private detective. And, you know, I had a fabulous boss. Often I would open up, you know, the financial pages of the New York Times in the morning and there would be cases I was working on. He had the big cases. He had the big financial cases of the era often. And um, I remember I was investigating this one guy. I go to see him. And it occurred to me I could get people to talk to me if they thought I was a filmmaker because I would show up without a camera and then people would think, Oh, he doesn't have a camera present. He's a filmmaker, so I can say anything. <laughs> this worked? It actually worked. By the way, often the stupidest ideas are the most practical. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> and um, so I'm in this guy's house interviewing him. And I don't know if I should reveal this, but I'll do it anyway. I often was wearing a wire. I was wearing a tape recorder and recording conversations. I've always believed that Truman Capote's claim that he could just remember verbatim an hour or two hour long interview was just, what's the technical term? Hokum. Bullshit. 
<laughs> and um, so I'm there talking to this guy, and then I think he's really talking to me because he thinks I'm a filmmaker. But wait a second. I am a filmmaker. I mean, I was a filmmaker. I want to be a filmmaker again. But in this context, not so much. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm a private detective trying to get information for a client. How did that experience influence your filmmaking? Did you start that after the first two films? Yeah. And before the Thin Blue Line? Before. When I got the money, and it wasn't money for the Thin Blue Line, it was just money to interview this Dallas psychiatrist, Dr. James Gregson. Uh, the whole Thin Blue Line was an accident. Complete accident. Well, why were you interviewing the, the doctor in the first place? Because I was really fascinated by psychiatric testimony uh, at trial. And there was this legendary psychiatrist known as Dr. Death. Who would testify at all the trials. Texas, well, you know this much better than I do, but capital punishment was struck down in Furman v. Georgia, and all these states scurried about trying to find a way to reinstitute the death penalty. Texas came up with a provision Future dangerousness. Uh, you can sentence someone to the hot seat if you can show he's going to do it again. And I was very fond of pointing out that I didn't believe you could predict human behavior except in one instance. What this psychiatrist would say at the penalty phase of a capital murder trial. You could predict this with 100% accuracy. And yeah, I went down to see him. I remember it was on my it was it was on my birthday, and um, it's a cold day in Dallas. And I really liked Doctor Death. He told me he had had a lot of trouble. He had to give up his private practice because patients did not feel comfortable discussing their personal problems with someone called Dr. Death. <laughs> it gave them a moment of pause. It produced a certain, shall we say, reticence. So this, is how the, this is how the Thin Blue Line began? Yeah. So I interviewed Dr. Death, and he's telling me about all these people that he has helped put on death row. And... The line he repeats again and again and again, they're different than you and me. You have to understand they're different than you and me. And so he suggests, Dr. Death suggests to me, Errol, you got to meet these guys. And I ask him to write down a list of people that I should talk to, people who had been sentenced to death in Texas. It's a complex story because a lot of these people had been commuted off of death row because of various court decisions, some of them involving the nature of jury selection in Texas. So I started to do prisoner auditions. I remember going to this one prison. I've been to a whole number of prisons in Texas. They're all units. Cofield unit, Darrington unit. So I'm in Cofield unit with a list of people that I want to talk to. I thought like I should have sent a letter saying, please dress informally. <laughs> the, day, the day I get there, the warden is like out of central casting. Cowboy boots, feet up on the desk, reading Playboy magazine. He says, he planning to pay these guys anything? I said, no, no, I, I, I'm not paying them. to pay them anything. He says, that's right. Pay them what they're worth. Nothing. So I do these interviews, fabulous interviews. One of them is with this guy, Randall Dale Adams. And 
he tells me this story, and I have no understanding of what he's talking about. He's talking about the kid, the kid. He said this, he said that. He was a good squirrely character. Did I think he was innocent? No, not really. No, I assumed he was guilty. And that was the beginning of three years of investigation. Do you think you would have returned to film but for Dr. Death? Uh, or would you have stayed as a private? I mean, did Dr. Death no, I always accidentally wanted to become, make I, your film career? Kind of it did. Yeah. I made the movie. No one wanted to distribute it. Only one person was interested in the distribution of the movie. You may have heard of him. Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> did he distribute it? Yes. Wow. How did you convince him to do that? He was interested in it. That was a good bet. Harvey was smart. Harvey was monstrous, but Harvey was smart. You can be monstrous, and you can be smart. I have two more questions about Lakari. You've interviewed lots of, in the last two decades, you've interviewed lots of powerful men who are, we might say, um, famous for their tricky relationship to the truth. Ooh. Robert McNamara, Donald Rumsfeld, Steve Bannon. John le Carre. I want to tell you this one story. And I, so I'm coming back. There was the premiere of The Pigeon Tunnel at Telluride Film Festival. I'm on a plane coming back to Boston. There's a guy sitting in front of me, tells me he saw the film, really liked the film, blah, 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 blah. He's a graduate of what I call the junior college down the street from here, Harvard. And all of a sudden he asked me this question. Who do you think was the worst president, Trump or Bush? This is what I thought would interest you. What's the answer? I said, give me a, give me a moment here. If you just think about this for a second. It didn't take very long, and I just said, Bush. And, and I told him why. Why? And do I hate Trump? You betcha. But Bush in his own idiocy, started a war that took the lives of hundreds and thousands of people. I remember McNamara, Robert McNamara, after 9-11 saying to me, you know, it was only 3,000 people. What did he mean by that? It meant that there was no good reason to go to war oh, I over that. I, th I thought he was talking about the number of dead. Yeah. He was talking about, you know, you're, he's talking about 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. It would have been hard not to go to war after 9-11. He made some bad decisions, especially with regard to Iraq. But it would have been very hard. To, it would have been impossible not to go to war after 9-11. I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It didn't... Back at the time, it seemed like it would be impossible. But a lot of things seemed obvious and impossible back then that turned out well, to be not obvious or not impossible. My usual line is... The, there's nothing so obvious that it's obvious. So how does the Carre compare as an interview subject to these others? He's the most articulate man I've ever interviewed. I mean, he's incredibly articulate. This is a guy. He's almost like a musical gift for words. If you ask him to speak in one of various sundry languages, Absolutely fluent in German. I've been told, I have no way of assessing it myself, that he sounded like a native-born speaker. Um, Same in with his French in the his film, His French too. is very good. And you ask him to do voices, which I do. Should have done more of it. He just... And he has a, just a beautiful voice, his own voice is beautiful. And he has a what do you call it, mellifluous and yes. musical? Yes. He has this extraordinary voice. It's a magical, musical voice. Yeah, there's no one quite quite like him. He said to you point blank, I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm always suspicious when someone oh, yeah. tells you that they're that's, going that's to tell you the truth. That's a good indication that someone's yeah. just setting you up for a, an extended spat of lying. And what do you think? Did he? Or was he candid? I don't think anybody tells you the truth. 
First of all, there's this sort of stupid idea. I've written a script. I should show you the script because I'm curious what you think of it, about Ed Gein. And it's about, I sometimes call it the great Cartesian error, that we have privileged access to our own minds, our own brains, however you want to describe it. And we don't. Just because the thing is sitting resident in my skull doesn't mean I know what's going on up there. I don't. And I don't think that a movie like The Pigeon Tunnel is about, as David Cornwell himself would say, you're not sitting there ready to detect the lie. He says, in an interrogation, you're waiting for the lie and acknowledging the lie and letting the person who has lied know that you have detected the lie. Uh, I think, oh, okay, you know, that's an interesting um, cosmology and interesting metaphysic. Most people don't know when they're lying. They don't even know when they're telling the truth. Uh, and truth, I think you would like this also. I always cite Pascal. The truth, like the search for God, is a quest. God isn't handed over to you on a silver salver. Truth isn't handed over to you on a silver salver. You pursue the truth. You try to ascertain what's out there in the world. And is there a fact of the matter? Yeah. With Randall Bale Adams, this officer, Robert Wood, stops this car. The driver pulls a gun from out underneath the seat and pumps five bullets into this cop. And the car speeds away. The cop is dead. There's a fact of the matter. My friend now... I asked to see Saul Kripke. We were talking about Rashomon once, and he said, oh, it's obvious, you know, they're all lying. It's not that truth is subjective. It's not that the world is variable. It's that we deceive ourselves. We lie to ourselves. We misrepresent. We align. We confuse. Makari said we all live in a clandestine situation. He thought all of life was a clandestine situation. Well, he's probably right. He said to you, and I'll end with this, I cannot imagine that as an interrogator or an interviewer, you aren't also in part looking for yourself. Is that true? It sounds awfully glib, but I think it is true. Is it true of you? I think it is. Aren't we all trying to figure out who in hell we are? Who am I? I? You know, you know. It's interesting to talk to a guy who had so much trouble with his father. My father died when I was two years old. I have no memory at all about him. I have lots of memories of my mother telling me what my father was like, but I was always maybe this is where the obsession with epistemology comes from. I always felt, no, I didn't know, and I would never know it, that he would always be removed from me. The housekeeper who brought me up, who I adored, who was a staunch Jewish family, was a staunch Roman Catholic, drove my mother crazy by going with her to Mass. I loved going to Mass with her. And she would always say to me, well, your father would never have tolerated this kind of behavior, which I'm sure is true, although I just did not know him. And there was a kind of mystery, a, a, a kind of a, a black hole at the center of my family. Who was this man? And what was my relation? He called me, according to my mother, he called me the little professor. And, and at uh, age one or two? At age two. Yeah, and um, and here you have this guy, David Cornwell, telling you these stories about his father. His father is absent part of the time, or kind of absent, part, not like my father. My father was absent and dead. His father is absent and in prison and defrauding women and children 
and doing various despicable things of one kind or another. So just the difference between him and me in that respect fascinated me. You mentioned about the surprise about this contradiction in him. He tells a story about his father asking him for money. David was really successful at a fairly early age. Now, really successful. He's spy came in from the cold selling millions of copies around the world. He's an international success. His father asked him for money. Now, if this was me, you know, I'd be glad to give my father money. Well, it's quite a counterfactual, but I think to myself, I would be glad to give my father money. That would be a wonderful thing. But I certainly don't have as much money as David Cornwell had. And he refuses his father. He, he kind of throws him out. And he's offended. And that surprises me. It was because he, he didn't want to get played. He thought he was being played by his father, who had, who had, who had okay, been wait a, a terrible father. Jack. He said that, though. I know, he does say that. But so what? So what he's being played? Of course he's being played. His father wants him to give him money and wants him, either by making him feel guilty or whatever. Of course he's playing him. We're all playing everybody. So what? I'm not defending him. I'm just telling him what he said. But he did give him some money. He said it was extremely painful. And in the end, he wouldn't give him what he wanted. And I was wondering about this because, I mean... It was, right? nothing, it was nothing it was to David. Pennies, right? He must have had so much money. He, he, wouldn't, so, he, he wouldn't even have noticed what his father was He asking. had a tsunami of money. Yeah. But he just... Was he so hurt and so damaged that he couldn't bring himself to... I don't know. It, it always is. It's it's it, it puzzled me. Maybe I should have asked him why. You, why, you, why you, it seemed like a stupid thing to say. Like why? Why are you so angry? His father is pretty awful. Yeah, but people people are pretty awful, and they're still loved. I agree. Are you happy with the film? Of course not. You know, I think of all the things that I could have done, should have done, would have done. The usual. I'm glad it's over. And a friend of mine in graduate school in philosophy used to say there's only one true philosophical problem. What to do next? So having made this, I'm probably going to get to make another. And that, for me, is a good thing because what else am I going to do with myself? It's always better to be at the beginning of a project than to have to be talking about something that's done. Indeed. Thank you very much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare Podcasts by becoming a Lawfare Material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. Please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Look out for our other podcasts, including Rational Security, Chatter, Allies, and The Aftermath, our latest Lawfare Presents podcast series on the government's response to January 6th. Check out our written work at lawfaremedia.org. The podcast is edited by Jen Patia Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.